Welcome to the GameDev.TV Community Podcast. I'm your host KB, and I would like to introduce you to industry professionals and people who successfully made their path to the video game industry. I hope that you will enjoy the podcast and get useful tips that will bring you closer to achieving your dreams. Now, let's get right into the podcast. Now, uh, just give the guest a little bit of uh, information about who you are, and then we'll go from there. Sure. So, uh, my name is Erwin. I'm one of the founders. I was working in retail uh, myself about 10, 12 years ago, and I experienced myself how difficult it is to communicate because people that were (laughs) colleagues back then uh, didn't have like a corporate phone or a corporate email address. So we used a lot of paper and bulletin boards and text messages to communicate. And I thought, well, much easier if we bring that online in an app and that's speak app. Mm -hmm. No, 100%. Yeah, people are horrible communicating. No matter what you have, you just got to make it simple and easy, like what you did, and then people can communicate. So now, back in the day when you were like young, you say it's in your blood, did you always like think of like business ideas? Your parents were always like, you're going to do this or that? Like, how was that like your childhood? I was, well, when I was 12 or 13 years old, I already like found pet projects to make money on school. And wow. I don't know, back in the days, I'm not sure about you, but like... Um, like creating like DVDs or CD-ROMs, like by downloading them from the new servers and then creating them for all your classmates and then earn a a couple of those type of things. Um, So yeah, it was always in my blood to to, do something. Um, Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so those things, did they like make you tons of money when you were younger? Like did you, what motivated you to do that? Like was it the money or just the passion for it? I think the latter, it's like being busy and uh, like mm-hmm. creating something from nothing, even how small it can be, um, that gave me so much energy. So, uh, and then of course, as a result, the money is definitely very pleasant. So oh, yeah. when I was 12 or 13 years old, I had like, like all the stuff that you can imagine as a young kid. So, yeah. Hey, that's awesome. So now when you were in high school and, and then going to, did you go to college? Yeah, well, in, I'm from Europe, so I grew up in Amsterdam. I went to university there, um, and only two years ago I moved to New York. Okay, so what was it like in Europe? In uh, where you say Amsterdam, right? Yeah. Amsterdam. How was your? Uh, how was growing up there? Was it nice? Was it? You miss it? Um, well, that's multiple questions. It it was very nice. Um, school was always very easy for me, so yeah. I always had to do things next to it either like sports or hobbies or like doing some entrepreneurial stuff. Um, I do miss it because all my friends and family live there. But on the other side, I really enjoy New York City. So mm. it's an amazing city, as no, you know. Yes, I, yeah, it's it's amazing. Actually, I'm going to go there at the end of this year to, uh, to just celebrate, I guess, the end of the year, end of 2020. It's been a crazy year. It's been a crazy year, yeah, and especially travel restrictions. It's mm-hmm. it's tough because I haven't been able to visit Europe since January, and normally I visit it every two months. So wow, how would you deal with that? <laughs> Zoom calls. Just deal with it like the rest of the world, right? So <laughs> yeah, it's best to comply and uh, try to uh, to get the situation under control as soon as possible by uh, by contributing yourself to it as well so Mm -hmm. and how did you handle the whole uh, COVID experience for your business for the business it was pretty good because as you can imagine especially now businesses really need to communicate with their staff Mm -hmm. and that's typically very difficult when it is a frontline employee right so we've seen an uptake in a lot of yeah new business and Mm -hmm. clients expanding or implementing much faster than than before on the other side of the spectrum, a big portion of our business is coming from retail and hospitality and, mm. and aviation as well. They have been hit very, very hard, obviously. Oh, yeah. and, and, and it's very difficult to, to keep tra- get traction in those industries for us. So. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, let's get down to what is exactly the business? Like, you started it when? How long? About 10 years ago. Ten years ago, and then how? Like when you started it, what was the idea? The same idea you have now, and just expanded on it, or was it did it change over time? Um, it's it's always been the same category. So 
it started in supermarket in retail. I had a part-time job there. Experience how difficult it is to communicate with all the bulletin boards and phone lists and everything. Uh, decided to make that easier by technology, mm-hmm. and that is it's still that today. So we still uh, and of course that technology evolved like more with apps and like more with video posted mm-hmm. 10 years ago etc cetera, etc cetera. but in in essence it's the same we we solved that challenge to to help retailers or manufacturers or hotels to to communicate better with their frontline em- uh, employees mm-hmm. and were we working at a retail store was it or was yeah, it multiple you've never heard about it it's a it's a company like a supermarket called plus mm. p-l-u-s plus um it's it has about twenty thousand employees in the netherlands mm. but yeah it's a it's a fairly small uh company mm-hmm. and so then you said you worked there for 10 12 years did you learn anything from that experience that like helped you build your business i've learned a lot of things um i was a front-time worker myself a manager um can be as basic as leading a team to dealing with like i don't know um like everything that is in 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 the retail operations right selling products helping customers uh driving customer experience in the end um leading your part-timers and have them being productive so it's a big yeah i was spending i was sometimes spending an hour to call people when when the truck got a delay in delivering the goods right mm-hmm. so they were scheduled to to arrive at five so then you plan all your employees to start at five but then the truck got a delay for whatever reason and you want to start like at seven how are you going to reach out 40 part-timers and you have to call them or send them text messages and stuff so yeah those type of experiences still i still bring uh with mm-hmm. me now for people who haven't started their own business what's like the misconception between like how hard is it to start a business and how easy it is it like was it just easy to be like hey i had this idea i'm gonna start building it i know the whole process is hard but like the idea of just starting something is it easier than most people think um well what i think like when we started we felt the pain in practice like working in retail experiencing a, a pain a challenge ourselves and and then finding a solution for it i think that situation and then like seeing the opportunity and jump into it was pretty easy however it would be i think like very difficult if you would be sitting in a room thinking of i oh, i want to have the next best idea right so yeah I'm think about uh, i want to do something entrepreneurial i want to have a startup and i'm just going to think about doing something i think that's much more difficult back to my story once we found uh when we experienced a challenge and we, we decided on a solution then you just start very small with it it was first more, almost more like a pet project but then more and more retailers saw the opportunity they want to buy the solution and the products that we offered and that yeah that really enabled our growth then mm-hmm. investors came investors saw the opportunity started investing money in the company we can hire more people we can grow faster and then step by step and step if i would ask my 10 year younger self now and what i'm currently doing i wouldn't have a clue <laughs> what i'm doing now and pro so yeah it's like step by step, you uh, you hope to be on the good path and mm-hmm. yeah, guide your decisions by data, but also gut feeling. No, yeah, that's that's true. What you said though, like step by step, because you can have this idea. It could be for anything, entrepreneur, creative, anything, and you'll think you have to have it right away. But like you said, step by step, you do it slowly, and you'll figure it out over time. So if you think of trying to do everything all at once, you're probably like crash and burn. You'll be like, I don't know what I need to do, lawyers. I don't know what I need to invest. I don't know who I need to hire. But then you're like, take it slowly. Build it up. When I need it, I'll bring it in, and then I'll just handle it. And then eventually, you'll get the business like you have today. But yeah, I feel like if you, everybody tries to think of that idea and then try to like make their business plan, like, oh, I got all of it right now, it just doesn't work out. Yeah, and I think it's, I see it also as a journey. So mm-hmm. the, it's very cliche, maybe, but like it's a journey from starting with the two of us, and we now at hundred people. You cannot do that overnight. 
No. You have to do that gradually. Or you can do it overnight, like by, I don't know, raising 50 or 100 million, hire 100 people, and then hope in one or two years the return will come. But that's, hope. that's like, <laughs> like not, not the obvious. In our way, it was much more gradual journey, and it taught me so many things and experiences, and yeah, that's been great. So. Mm-hmm. And you're saying you were 10 to 12 years in uh, the real team. So what was your plan? Was it like you were just working to save up money or were you working to fund the business? Yeah, at first, when it was a pet project, uh, the other founder, Patrick, and myself, we both like put in some of our savings mm-hmm. to hire uh, a company to develop the first version. Mm-hmm. And then we started selling that. And that was basically like paying for our vacations every year. Yeah, every year. essentially. Yeah. And then when we saw that there were more and more customers uh, joining, one of the customers introduced us to an investor. With the mm-hmm. investor, we raised quite significant amount of money, of course, in different tr- uh, tranches. Um, and we were able to really hire people ourselves. Mm-hmm. But then you see that your costs like go up and up and up and then of course your revenues as well but that was there was a pivotal moment uh, like when that investor joined we both decided to stop our jobs next to it mm, that makes sense and, and before it was more like a pet project for a couple hours a week or visiting some retailers showing the product you have they they got excited and, mm. and but not a full-time uh, investment from our side mm-hmm. and then you were just working at retail right no school no nothing just the just the job that was yeah it was well it was retail a uh, part-time retail job next mm-hmm. to my university study so maybe okay, okay. in europe it's a bit different so um you have the primary school secondary school then you have high school or university mm-hmm. yeah in that area like from 16 years till 22 23 yeah. or like either high school or university uh, for an X amount of time a week, but then next to it, you can have a part-time job. So this was like a part-time job next to university study. So you made this business while also in university? Yeah. Okay. And then you finished university while working on the business too? Like you didn't drop yeah. out? All right, cool. Correct. And then, uh, and you were going to university for business? Sorry? You were going to university for business? Oh, yeah. So I did business administration, Mm -hmm. um, bachelor, and I did a master's of finance. And I graduated like on track within four years. Um, Not cum laude, but it's all good. (laughs) I mean, the rest is history. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) No, (laughs) but let's bring like, like the the fact that i i like numbers and i have a feeling for numbers I, I also like i have a lot of benefits from it every day now that i'm building this business because in the end it's also about numbers right you make costs and those costs need to attribute to your revenue or like those 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 numbers and those metrics and kpis need to work because else you cannot scale your business or you skill on failure but that's not what we want to do so i agree now a lot of the stuff you learned did you use it all or is it was it like really beneficial to go or do you feel like you could have done it without it? Um, like, uh, all honesty, like most books and the materials that are in those books, I don't apply in my day, day-to-day work. But I, I see it more as an experience that mm-hmm. university like creates also values um, mm-hmm. and, 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 and some like intellectual and analytical thinking. No, it's true. That is something that I definitely bring with me every day. Uh, so would I be able to do it without? Maybe, maybe not. But who knows, right? Yeah, who knows? Because no, that's, that's true with some people nowadays. It's more like it's an investment. I don't know how it is in uh, Europe, but here it's like tons and tons of money. So most people don't know if it's the right decision to make, especially when they do their own business. Like some people say, instead of taking that money to go to school, you should take that money to start your own business, stuff like that. But uh, but yeah, and then I wanted to get into the the mindset you had when you were in school. Was it just like you wanted to get good grades, you wanted to do your own thing, or were you kind of just like just going to school, doing your own thing, chilling? Yeah, it was always easy on me. Um, it was not very difficult. Um, easy student in that way. But I did value it. Like I really wanted to have that paper. Yeah, but, but um, like 
of course, like uh, getting your uh, certificate or diploma or however you call it. I think that's yeah, that's in the end what you why you do it, right? So, mm-hmm. do I ever like had to show that paper to anyone? No. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. But, like nobody asked me for it. But maybe if I would apply for a different type of job, like a company like Merrill Lynch or I don't know Bank of America, probably yeah. have to. Show it, but. That never happened to me. So, mm-hmm. but it taught me. A lot. No, I agree. So, like the way that you're putting it, I feel like the best way to take college or any type of learning experience is to go there to really get the most out of it. Not just to like do check marks and get all A's, but to like actually learn a material, actually interact with people. Another great thing I've heard is you just meet a lot of people in this institution because you never know where they're going to go and they might help you wherever you need to be. Like for instance, how has it networking been for you? Like, have you networked a lot to make it where you are today? Yeah, so, well, where I'm from in the Netherlands, it's smaller than probably one of the smallest states in the U.S. Wow. So, there's definitely about 10 or 15 universities, I believe, maybe more. So, you quickly get uh, to build up a network of people that, that like, spread out of the country quickly. Mm-hmm. And that's been very beneficial. And, of course, over time in my professional career, building SpeakUp, like, so much more network build up there but i also have the experience to sight unseen move to new york Mm. without network and build something from scratch right and that's been two years ago since i moved it's quite a challenge but then in the end like it's also a mindset how like I'm very outgoing, so I wanted to go to events. I made myself a promise the first year. Every week I will visit one, try to meet people, build up a network. Maybe it doesn't immediately return into something. That's totally fine. But you, like, build up some kind of energy around you with people that you can rely on. and That's very valuable. But it is, in the end, your own, like, decision and mindset to make that happen. Nobody will do it for you, so... No, well said. Yeah, nobody nobody will do anything for you. You can plan things out, you can say things, but you have yeah. to make the decision. And networking isn't easy for everyone. I mean, I've learned that it's actually it's more people are more able to they want to engage. They want to get themselves out there. But the how would you tell people who are afraid to go to those events or or not as outgoing as you are? Maybe start with events that um, are not too large. Maybe like smaller meetups where 10 or 15 or 20 people in a close setting meet with each other instead of going to an event with thousands or hundreds of people right so to be in all fr- uh, in all honesty i also don't really like to like proactively step onto somebody and start a conversation and like mm-hmm. i don't know it's like I excel a bit better in the the smaller audiences, but then really build a connection. So if you're afraid for that, maybe apply the same approach and start small. And then Mm -hmm. gradually over time, it brings you more confidence. And now I'm speaking on like events with four or 500 people in front of me, but probably because years and years back, I started doing this gradually and and earning that confidence. Mm -hmm. Which you meant like you speak in front of people and give like, yeah. Nice. How how's that like? Yeah, it's, it's nice. It's like always, some kind of an adrenaline and like pressure before you start, and then the first ten twenty seconds is awkward for yourself. Probably nobody will notice, and then you get into it, and then it mm-hmm. goes well. In my case, it goes smoothly. So, wow. and then how do you prepare for those events? Uh, well, you have to, of course, create like materials that you want to present, think about the um, talking points, work with, like in my case, with the marketing team to develop very nice appealing content that it looks nice and brings over the story and try to not make it too big. I always try to share three lessons. And when, in my case, it's of course also to promote our solutions and speak up as a company, don't be too salesy. Just Silty? try to, sh- yeah, like, don't try to sell your product and like, mm, like, no, yeah. like, 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 just not listening, but just like try to like be too commercial. I think you have to 
put yourself in the shoes of the of the listener and say, okay, well, what is most valuable to that person? Mm-hmm. Bring value, share experiences. How do similar companies do X? How did they solve this challenge or that challenge? Speak out of your experience and not like, oh, my product does this and uh, <laughs> can help you with that. Like X, that, that doesn't work. So <laughs> it doesn't really. Like if you tell a good story, they like you enough. They're like, oh, I don't really care. I'll, just, I'll buy it because I like the person. Yeah. Be authentic. Exactly. Be that's a, that's a Moses thing, right? Be authentic and it'll sell everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, be authentic is that's the big thing. Sorry guys, I was on mute for a second because uh I live next to a military base and there's airplanes flying over like all the time around this time. So I was like that really loud noise is that's that's what you heard. I swear. It sounds like it's in the room with you. So I was like, okay. Wow. I'll just let let this all pass. So yeah, but excuse me, and I'm sorry about that. But um, hi, Erwin. How are you doing today? Good. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. Uh, so I would, I have a question for you. Uh, you talked about uh, speak speaking and um, bringing a message. What would you say your mission is to people beyond like your company, but your personal like life mission? What would you say that is? Oh, that's a. Uh... That's a nice opening question. <laughs> right? <laughs> well, I've been listening to you. I'm buying time I, now. I, you I, know, I right? I'm buying time now to think. Um, That's funny. I, th- I think the first thing that comes to mind is share the experiences that I, I had um, in order for people to learn from, not because I'm a know it all, but just like to maybe prevent somebody from making the same mistakes that I have been making in the yeah. last 10, 12 years. Yes, that, that, that's uh, that's very helpful. And it makes a, a lot of sense because it's just like reading a book. You can learn the lessons that someone has put into a book and they, that could help you with future things you may encounter and your mindset and things like that. So I really appreciate that. Yeah, sure, but it's a nice opening question. I had to buy some time for myself. What gets what gets you up in the morning? You wake up every day like ready to get after it, or? Oh no, man, the the mornings are tough sometimes. <laughs> are you like a night owl, or are you just just mornings are tough? No, it's more like I like sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> That's common Don't in twenty twenty. Answer that you expect, but no, I like I'm. Um, I'm not per se a night owl, um, but I also don't like early mornings. Like I do quite some exercising, so four, five, six times a week. That also has a impact on your body and you need to recover and take rest. I think that's important. So I try to sleep at least seven and a half to eight hours every night. Seven to eight hours. That's not bad. It's normal. Yeah. Well, I think, yeah, if your body's getting a consistent amount of sleep, that's pretty like seven to eight hours consistently that's that's good yeah i try to sleep well, if i if i take less than six or five hours i i cannot i cannot perform yeah it def- yeah it definitely depends on the person too because i i think i'm around the five to six hours but recently my body has been playing this game with me where i wake up exactly around like 2 30 to 257 in the morning every time Dang. And I'm like, okay, well, this is a quote by Rumi that says, you know, the the morning has something to say to you. So if you wake up and if you're awakened in the middle of the night, stay up. The universe is trying to tell you its secrets. So if you just randomly wake up. And so I wake up and I'm just like, what secrets do you have for me? <laughs> <laughs> That's what makes me going. I like play a game with myself. That's what gets oh, me out of bed. <laughs> that, that's 7 30 in the morning and that's early enough for me so. yes oh yes. 7 30 is early yeah i thought you may wake up at like 9 or 10 oh no no yeah 7 30 is early some people yeah. still like are still sleeping yeah. Yeah, um, some people <laughs> wake up at 6 and you're like you're crazy i wake up at 9 i'm like okay that's still kind of early like i feel like 10 is when you finally reach the point when it's like all right you you woke up a little too late i'm like all right i gotta get stuff done but but yeah. no, that's cool. And then when time you go to bed, like 10, 11? Yeah, between 11 and 12, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that makes up like uh, between 11 and 12, 7.30 waking up. 
Well, yeah. seven and a half, eight hours of sleep. So you have what like is a your... night. Oh, go ahead. You have like yeah. a night routine. You like we just go to sleep. Well, I brush my teeth. <laughs> <laughs> That's literally my night routine. Brush my teeth, go to sleep. I don't really have because some people meditate, some people do journals, some people watch a show, do this and that. I'm like, I just go to sleep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that that's basically it. Sometimes do the exercise. Sometimes, of course, watch Netflix or Prime or whatever. Yeah. Not 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 every every day the same, except the brushing the teeth. Yeah. <laughs> do you have a morning routine? Waking up. <laughs> <laughs> Brush your teeth. That's uh, my morning routine. <laughs> then off to work. <laughs> <laughs> no, of course, some breakfast. I walk to the office because it's like super close. Mm. Um, that's basically it. I am curious. Do you think that like the idea of like a morning and night routine is kind of like a product of self-help, but not really like effective? Because I've noticed in my own like routine, if I try to do so many things in the morning and night, and like I don't get the thing that's important done, but instead it's like wake up, just do the thing that you need to do. I am more effective and more productive. Like, do you feel like that's like kind of like a, a negative impact of self-help? I don't know. I wouldn't yeah. judge it in that way. I think I would see it as if that works for a person. That's true. Totally fine. Um, yeah. I just do my own thing. <laughs> Focus I agree on with that. I have <laughs> everything in my own control. So. Yeah. No, but I like that too. It's like you're just like I just do my thing and it works and I'm, I'm yeah. Yeah. Because I think people judge themselves too much too. Like I'm gonna be like this person. I'm like that person. It's like just do your thing. Just do it. <laughs> yeah, you have to like you get you have to be your own like uh, unique individual. Because it only works for you the way you express yourself and how you do things can work for what you need done and what like you want to meet and gather out of life. And some people have different dreams and aspirations than you, so they have different ways they want to apply themselves. So yeah. I would agree with him in that response, that it has to just fit you. Like, no, I love he, the response, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> All right, that's important. Um, so what advice do you have to someone growing up who wants to like run their own business and be their own boss and what's the question <laughs> what <laughs> yeah it is a big one <laughs> what advice do you have someone for someone who wants to run their own business and be their own boss like what what it is like or like, what advice would you have for them? Okay. Oh, this... what advice? Okay, yeah. got it. I got it. Um, oh, that's a very broad question. Um, it's also in line with my previous answer, I think. Uh, control, like, focus on the things that you control can control yourself. Okay. There's always, like, external world that you would have to adapt to, but keep things to yourself. Like, don't put reasoning or blame externally, but, like, own it, act responsible. And I would say if you build your business and or, and or start your business, try to base your decisions on data, but don't forget gut feeling. But it mm -hmm. should only not not also, also only be gut feeling or only data. So it's like it's a combination of seeing opportunities, but also have some kind, type of proof that the, that the gut feeling is also making sense. And that, like in the end, there's a lot of people that start their businesses, which is of course great, um, but there's also a lot of businesses that start just for the sake of starting a business. Mm -hmm. And then after a year or one and a half year, they develop the product and then they start thinking of, okay, now we are gonna sell this product, but then actually there is no market or nobody wants to pay for it, right? right. So instead of having those um, like major like like steps and try to validate it right on. Like if you have an idea, try to pitch it to 10 or 15 people. Can be friends, can be family, but can also be person on the street. Like validate it before you do th certain things. I try like to that. be analytical in that way. Mm -hmm. I like the idea you said just go up to like 15 people maybe on the street and just tell them your idea. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. And, you know, like, and, I, and it's so, funny. Yeah. But also, like, 
a lot of people like your idea. They say, oh, this is a great idea, etc., because they are afraid to say that it is a bad idea. But I would always ask the question, like, but would you, are you willing to pay for it? Mm. If I if I if I if I show you now a contract, they're like a, would you sign up for it? Would you want to pay for it? Because there's a lot of people that are very positive and exciting about your idea, until the moment they have to get their wallet out and have to start paying for it. Right. <laughs> then when it's time to invest. Changes. Yeah, money is always a symbol of commitment. Like people will talk about it as long as they they don't have to give some type of commitment and money being one of those. So it's yeah. like you have to see like, would you be committed to invest in the product or use the product or whatever service that may be rendered? So it is a good idea to have like a test market. I like that. Yeah, and, and if if you're willing to pay for it, what what is the amount that you would be willing to pay for it? Mm -hmm. That's true. Is this like is this truly solving a pain for you, or is this just a nice to have? Right. Ooh, a little research and development. I feel like that that's what makes the uh, the business keep going because it's like the market is ever changing, and understanding like your niche market is important. So who you're predominantly selling to. And so now you have to understand your buyer because they're really your boss. You know, your consumer is really your boss. I, I appreciate that advice. I like that. As someone who's learning. That's an interesting segue, segue also in a different um, advice even. Like think very thoroughly who your ideal buyer is. And don't be afraid to like really focus it to a small group. So. And because if it's too big, you're like, I always say you can better be something very great for a small group than that you're like, like nothing for everyone. Mm -hmm. so really yeah. Own that first vertical or that first type of buyer persona and then out of a winning position, you can go to other segments instead of trying to go after every vertical or every type of buyer persona, but then you don't really address any of them. Be very focused and yeah. don't be afraid that, oh, but then my market becomes so small. Right. Like but later at least, on, it expand, so. Right. It will. Yeah. That's a, that's a really, uh, that's a really great point. So if I relate that back to my own experience, we started in retail, mm -hmm. in supermarkets. Our first products were only tailored on supermarkets. So. That's where we became successful. So then we made it bigger to retail. When we started to get traction in retail, we saw like, oh, there are similarities also with hospitality. Let's now add that vertical as well um, and then gradually expand. So now that I moved to the US, basically a startup again in a new market without brand awareness, instead of like going after four, five, six verticals, go back to one or two and become first successful there and then expand again. No, you really hit that on the head. That's that's really good because it's, first of all, you had the, um, the self-awareness to realize, hey, I'm restarting technically because now I've gone to New York and I got to do it like I did at the beginning. But that's the only way I can ensure that it's going to be successful in the end. Yeah, and, and then even like bridging an ocean for a moving from uh, Europe to n New York um, also requires a real open mind to go after this market because certain things in Europe work significantly different than here and the other way around. So mm -hmm. if you would look back at like, okay, this is what I've done and what we made, su made us successful in Europe, so we're going to replicate that here in North America, might, be, might not be successful at all. You have to like listen to the market and ask those validation questions again and then step by step you build out your network and then you have a few early adapters and those early adapters bring you to a larger group and then like so it's basically for me it's starting all over again from scratch and that that's very like that gives me a lot of energy because I really like that phase much more than managing like uh, more like scale up company. Mm. 
Now, what is the day like? What's your day to day like as a CEO? Is it is it a lot of work? Is it busy, busy, busy? Yeah, but I try to have like a good balance. Mm-hmm. Balance like the work, but spend time like it, your private life need to be in good balance and need to be in a good shape. Uh, you, your body, physically as well, mentally. Um, I think with that I can be very productive. But if I'm on work, I'm really at work. I don't get distracted by like text messages from friends and family. I just don't look at them unless there's an emergency, of course. But um, really like in the moment, try to focus on the things that you're doing. Okay. How does my day look like? It's very different. Sometimes I'm speaking at events. The other day I'm speaking to my shareholders. The other day I'm working actively with somebody at sales and marketing team to go after this new client opportunity or develop a new sales presentation deck to outline your new messaging uh, tailored for the North American market. Um, Sometimes I'm trying to have a call with a customer and make them even more successful with our product or understand more of the needs they might have. Mm -hmm. And how do you... How do you organize all that? Do you ever feel like you burn out or there's too much to do or you just have it all like figured out? I'm pretty structured. Mm -hmm. I also have some technology that really helps me uh, and supports me. I still also have like a little book where I write my tasks in Mm -hmm. and then I try to mark them off every day. Um, I've organized my email in a way that it is very like very easy for me to work on outstanding items and move away the ones that can be archived, etc. Uh, I don't have an inbox with uh, 50,000 unread messages. I always have an empty email inbox at the end of the day. But that works for me, not for everyone. That's totally mm-hmm. fine. This just works for me. Mm-hmm. But I like yeah. about keeping in the structured. Oh, you can go, Moses. I was going to say, I was just going to piggyback on the. Uh... <laughs> the fact that I don't like a clutter e bo- uh, inbox either. Like, I don't know, it just also just gives me a sense of that, hey, I'm on top of this. If I can keep that a little organized, I can see what's actually happening. And then it spills over into all the other areas of my life. I'm always like, okay, let me keep this tidied up because I need to be able to see how things are moving, you know? Because if it's not, if it's too chaotic, you can't really see where it's going. But if it's a nice yeah. balance, you can see it better. But, yeah, for and for some people it does work, and yeah. that's totally fine. I just yeah. know what works that's for their me. lifestyle. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And what I was gonna say too about the, having a structure like that—it's kind of like being disciplined. Is if you get everything organized right, you do everything you need to do, then you have the freedom to do whatever you want. So because you know, oh, I'm gonna get that done tomorrow. Then today is done. I'm good to go. I can relax. I can hang over. I want to do. It's this idea of like people think rules and all this stuff is actually like making your life less free but actually in fact it's making your life more free do you feel it's the same way like because you're structured day you're free to do whatever you want well in the end i started this company to be my own boss Mm -hmm. uh, right so i decide my own agenda and calendar but i act very responsible right so i want to the bigger goal is to make this company a success and like exit it uh, for a good value one day so that bigger goal drives me every day to to make the most out of it. But mm-hmm. in that day, I try to work as structured as possible mm-hmm. in order for me indeed to go home with without like having to worry like, oh, I still have to do those 15 or 16 tasks or emails and like, yeah. In the end, you also need to like hire people and then and, and have people join your team that that can take that operational burden from you, right? Mm. You cannot yeah. do any like everything. You need to also like hand off certain activities. Mm-hmm. Sometimes that's difficult, but it's very important to scale. That's probably one of the hardest part, right? Building the whole like training system and having all the people do the things that you want them to do. Yeah. And it's especially also closing the loop. So if you agree that a person should do certain activities, then A, of course they need to perform and deliver. You also have to close that, like, yeah, that feedback loop. Like, but on the other side, like, as a manager or as a boss, however you call it, I see it like I always have an analogy with, like, if you 
treat your like people in your team as a, a plant, like a little plant. You can better like give it water and like um, uh, proteins to grow, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of just crashing it down because you don't do this, or you don't do that, and you don't do, like. It's better to empower people in your team so that they can be their better self. So it's also like a management style. That's beautiful. I love that. No, it's it's true. As a leader, you need to um, understand that this is your vision, and they're just helping you build it. But at the end of the day, like nobody sees it the way you do. So just help empower them, help them grow, help them understand that like you care about them. So that way, they want to do the same for you. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And then, how does the how do you develop a training system? Because I always feel like that's a that's a big thing to do. Like training books, training manuals, training like systems. How do you do that? Well, we have a HR team in Amsterdam that mm -hmm. helps with that. Of course, you need some proper technology that can help you with that. Um, yeah, to, we always try to tie it back to our uh, corporate values. Mm -hmm. So if you have your like your mission and your vision and your corporate values outlined and then try to add, have the initiatives that you do, including training, like like built on those values. Um, and then it's also based on discipline, like um, in development, you, de you need different type of training than in sales or in marketing. Mm -hmm. And some training is generic, but most of them are based per discipline. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we, we do that partially ourselves or we use external companies or people to help us with that. And then, at the be did you come up with these core values at the beginning of your business when it was just you and uh, was it Patrick? No, they, they came a bit later. Mm. So it was, um, I think, the first five or six years we didn't really do those uh, those things. But then you start scaling and building, and then if you hire, like, if you go beyond 20, 25 people, then I think those things become much more important mm -hmm. because then it's more difficult to communicate. Uh, and to, to like trickle down your messages in the right way and how you build the culture, etc. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the way you put it, it makes it seem easier than, I guess, somebody who's never done it before. Like, I, I'm, I'm like putting it together in my head. I'm like, actually, it's not. You just get other people to, to come up with the, uh, like, the HR team. You get them to come up with the training materials. You have the goals that you set out, like the vision. And then there you go. There it is. Now, over time, you have to iterate it and make sure it fits and it's perfect. But... Mm -hmm. That's just how it is. That's how business, how creative work is. That's how all of it's done. Yeah, but that's also in line with what we talked about earlier, right? So this is like if you would do this all, this 10 years overnight, that's impossible. Mm -hmm. Exactly, so that's yeah. The, like, every, like there's always a challenge. You will never be done with challenges. And if, because if you finish the challenge that you're currently facing, then the, the new challenge appears. And that's like that's <laughs> yeah. the journey every time, always. So right, because life goes on, right? So there's <laughs> gonna be <laughs> more things happening. It's never finished. Yeah, and, and with growing the company and having more people, it, also those challenges become different. Um, mm -hmm. Like yeah, very different. You cannot even foresee them coming. Right, it's an no adventure. <laughs> yeah. It, and then again, uh, like my advice would be you know, on those moments, try to have your decisions uh, being leaded or being led by data and gut feeling. Mm. Okay. No, that's true. The intuition you have plus the data you're seeing to do the right thing. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. like the, like, it is really research and development. I call that like the left brain and the right brain. Like, the intuition is like the right brain and the left brain is like your intellect, the data and the things of that can be measured and that's tangible. Yeah. So, no, absolutely. It's really cool. I like it. It's like it's I guess the whole thing is a journey. There's never like a real destination except that you do have a goal. You said you alluded to a bigger goal that you have. But even when that goal is finished, you personally will still be moving forward in the journey of Erwin, like things that you want to go forward in in life, you know, it'll keep going forward. I'm not, I'm not sure who, who said it, but like the day you you stop learning is the day that you die, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh -huh. Oh, I don't know who did. They say, I think, um, 
There's you a lot of Franklin. Yeah, people. Kevin, you should know that one, Kevin. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's Benjamin Frank- Franklin, right? But then, like, it's the internet, so you never know, really, who said it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a, pro- a lot of profound people who have, like, uh, reiterated that point. <laughs> no, but, yeah, that one, I lo- I live by that one. It's, like, I'm never stop learning, whether it's languages, whether it's coding, whether it's, it's building stuff, editing, and just anything. I'm not stop learning. Because it's, it's, exactly. it's, I just don't get why people don't want to, like... That mindset of like, oh, you know, I'm I'm done with school and I'm done done learning. Like, I don't ever want to touch a book. I don't want to do anything. I'm like, the more I get older, the more I realize I'm like, yeah, but that's how you get to enjoy all the fruits of life. Like, it doesn't have to be something boring. Find something you care about and learn that. Whether it's like yeah. skateboarding to building a business. Like, find something and go learn and keep learning. Keep doing something with your life. Yeah, like, get in the sweet spot of, like, what you enjoy and do what you enjoy. I feel like that's important. Is that, um, so when you started to build your business, was it something, you said you want, I, I heard you say you wanted to be your own boss, but was the business you built something around what you enjoy? Um, well, no, it was actually before you uh, joined the call. Um, I started this business because I was working in retail mm-hmm. and I okay. experienced a challenge myself the challenge of communicating with employees that are very difficult to communicate with because they are not behind a computer all day. They don't have a company phone or a company email address. So I decided to make that easier by creating mobile technology. And I started that doing that first with the co-founder, Patrick. Uh, and we're still founders of this company, but we're, we grew to about 100 employees by now. Mm-hmm. And then what did it feel like when you got the... Uh the call from McDonald's to like partner with them. It was like actually that. the other way around. It, oh, you never... called them? <laughs> so you have to create those uh, opportunities. No, it started actually with a franchise owner in the Netherlands through network, like building, like always trying to like meet people and build value. Got an introduction at the franchise owner. So I pitched, yeah, I pitched the idea. Um, pitch what value we could bring and uh-huh. we got, we really liked it and decided to implement it and that was the yeah. first franchise owner and then th- like a month later the second started and then the third and it's like it's like a spreading like yeah like a, how'd you say it like a fire uh, yeah yeah it was like a spark and then it went into yeah. the whole plan and then at a certain time we had 20 percent or 25 percent of all the uh-huh. franchise owners in the, the netherlands and then the head office thought like, oh, that's interesting. We want it. So then we implemented like in the whole country. So, but that's a process of years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Never overnight, at, like right. at least not in my uh, business. But it's, yeah. it will see the thing that we get caught in the trap is, is that things happen like if they happen instantaneous, like nothing ever happens like that. Like, there's always a gestation period, you know? And you want the gestation period because if you don't, how can you support the growth if you aren't able to scale it and things like that? So it's good yeah. for healthy uh, healthy growth. Uh, you mentioned something that, like, red flagged in my mind. You said you have to go out and create some opportunities. That reminds me of the old axiom that uh, you, you have to knock on the door and the door will be open unto you, you know? And seeking you will find like those are very important like some people expect it to fall out of the sky but if you have like a desire you have to act on that desire or else it's just going to be a desire or a dream so i like that you took action that's like the main thing um action uh joan bias says action is the uh, antidote to despair Mm -hmm. action just totally agree Uh, you have to be driver's seat you have to create your own opportunities and your own path. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, sometimes it gets on your path and that that's totally fine. But in the end, like if you want to get the ball rolling, you have to put a lot of pressure behind it and keep doing that. And then when it starts rolling, it's like a snowball effect. It'll get bigger and bigger and bigger. But it, it needs to start somewhere. And that is by effort and working diligently and structured and perseverance and to really make it work. You have to always believe also in what you do. 
and of course sometimes you have your good days and you have your bad days that's totally fine but like a red line needs to be in the right direction i think mm -hmm. do, do you have any like um like mantra or affirmation or anything you use when you are going through those bad days to like recenter yourself and reground yourself so you can keep going forward no i do not no <laughs> <laughs> But, <laughs> Nothing <yeah>. wrong with that. <laughs> right. He's just chilling. He's just like, yeah. <laughs> and I'm curious about when you first came to um, New York and you brought your business over. How was that like? How many like? Does any obstacles and how did you get through them? Well, <laughs> <laughs> we can do another podcast on, only on that topic. So uh, yeah. uh, give me one. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> In a nutshell, no, it's, it's a very challenging experience to um, move a business over from one continent to another and then without any brand awareness, create network, create belief, get customers, scale your business to more and more people, have that culture been built up here in line with your company culture in Europe and have everybody feel included uh, and yeah really prepare for scaling even faster and faster which is always very painful so and then a lot of challenges on the way of hiring people uh, how do people perform how do you make them accountable um, how do you make them feel included create the best out of themselves like so many challenges <laughs> yeah. that's another topic for another time that yeah. is yeah that's a big one <laughs> it sounds like yeah it sounds like you can elaborate on that a lot but <laughs> <laughs> yeah but there's always that stage of like you said there's a stage of learning and then there's the stage of growing and those obstacles are the stage of learning because without them they, they wouldn't you wouldn't be challenged to go further so mm -hmm. The, op the, uh, the obstacles bring the opportunity of you to use your imagination and your willpower to like proceed forward. So I like that. Well said. Yeah. <laughs> yeah he's going to be the next big speaker. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I do feel like I have a lot to say, at least for my generation of people who want to move forward. But that's a whole conversation for another time. <laughs> I'm curious, what is your uh, greatest fear? That I'm not going fast enough. That you're not going fast enough? And how do you manage that fear? Well, by believing what you do, working structured, trying to have everything in balance, be healthy, be physically fit, if you work on things, be focused on that, don't get distracted. Uh, try to outsmart the external world, your competition. Mm. That's interesting. Because nobody is standing still, everybody is moving. So. Mm -hmm. Now, did you always have that fear, like not going fast enough? No. No, that's really in the type of business that we're now in. So. Uh, interesting. Do, do you think. Do you feel like that might be is like because you want to get to your other goal faster or like why do you why do you why is that your biggest fear? Because in the end, if you're not fast, faster than your competition, you will lose. That's true. OK. Right. Dang. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting one, because it's like I feel like it can it, it, like it's a fire, too, but I feel like it can also like prevent you from enjoying things. But I feel like you've probably handled that better than most people. Mm -hmm. like how do you, like, do you ever get thoughts when you're just chilling where you're like, hey, I should be working instead because I not, you know, we're not going fast enough? Yeah, like like in every business where people work, we'll, we'll make mistakes. So yeah, the, the, when you make mistakes, you go slower, so. Um, and and then you lose out of your competition. That that's that that have that has happened many times before. But you try to stand up and look forward and try to like 
catch up again. So. Yeah. One last thing before you have to head out. If you could have like one billboard that was like in space that said like your one quote, one thing, what would it be? What would be on that billboard? For speak up or for me personally or for just for anybody who is looking at it being like this is what Erwin's message is for the world. <laughs> your legacy. That would be so cliche. I would say something. <laughs> Focus on yourself. Take control. Well, that's it. Thanks for listening. You can find all courses at GameDev.tv or in the show notes at a discounted price. Get started with your game development journey today.